Getting geeky with Gamer Leaf, the podcast in which one man strives to level up his geekhood and helping you do the same one battle at a time. Now, let's get geeky with Gamer Leaf. Okay, yeah, so um, my name's Jack Randolph, and uh, I am a professional animal trainer, um, and I'm just going to tell you a bit about what I do and about how um, how I train animals and how I compete against the other trainers. So what happens is, first of all, um, probably about four or five days before the first event, um, we get we get told what the three events are going to be. So obviously the UK Championship is coming up, and um, they'll, they'll let us know, normally by a phone call, what are the three events going to be? There'll be an event from a from a from a from one of five different categories, and there'll be three different events. So there might be a speed event, a a power event, and maybe a technical or a team event. And what that means is that um your animal is going to have to compete in an, an event of that type. So the speed event might be um how fast can they move a body part? Uh, you know what's the fastest way you can get your animal to move in a minute? Uh, the power event might be something like maybe jousting so you have to kind of ride your animal and and um train with your animal to to do the best you can to ride it um and then there maybe the team event might be something like how do you stack your animal how many how many animals can you put in a tower how tall can you make that tower um and so yeah so we get told that about three or four days before the competition starts um uh, and it's our job to then we get we get then get delivered uh, a package with our seven animal names in uh so we get, only get to choose from seven of our animals and we have about we normally take about 42 animals with us around our tour um so we've got quite a big choice but from that from those seven animals we then have to choose one and that animal is going to be the one that um that we compete with across all three of those events so we need to think about you know what's going to be fast enough to have a really fast moving body part could it be a hummingbird with a really quick wing tip could it be a peregrine falcon flying straight down but then if you had that, then thinking about the jousting event, it's not going to be quite so good to joust on a hummingbird. You might want something a bit bigger. Um, so our, our kind of our professional role and our the real skill of the of the um, of the job comes from trying to compromise with those things and work out what's the most important event and how are you going to use your strategy to perform well, even at the events where you're not naturally so skilled. So then you um, you start with the first event and you and essentially you you, you take on the other competitors. Um, they'll obviously reveal what their animals are at the same time that you do, uh, normally in a, a in a kind of big uh, press conference. And then going on from there, you then uh, about a week later you'd have the first event and you'd have about a week to train your animal up for that event. Um, I think if I was let's say that I had chosen a, um, a hummingbird for that for that, which probably wouldn't be a great choice. Um, I would want to measure the the, uh, the end of the wing tip for the first event probably that would be the fastest moving body part in that first event uh, and my colleagues might also have a cheetah and run as fast as they can they might have a chameleon whose tongue uh, goes moves really fast and they measure that speed um, uh, and then once that event's done then um, we see who wins um, uh, and then you move on to the second and the third events and after you've had all three events there's kind of a scoring system uh, to to work out who wins who who performed the best um and, and basically yeah that's 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 what i do that's that's the job that i have that's my life and it's a it's a real pleasure to be in the in this community it's a it's a friendly one to be a part of and uh, yeah i i uh, really enjoy it okay does that sound familiar to you guys it doesn't to me either but that is actually the story of the, one of the trainers in the champion of the wild a new game on kickstarter by uh, tom claire which i found out earlier on today that he's actually a doctor and we're lucky enough to have on doctor i guess it would be dr tom claire are you the creator and the mastermind behind this game that, that's me yeah that's me i think mastermind's a generous term but i'll, I'll take it <laughs> Well, there you go. Yeah, you're famous. I heard you on uh, We're Not Wizards with Richard Simpson. So now you're famous and you're a famous doctor again. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, apparently so. Yeah, it was good fun being on with Richard, actually. Yeah, we had a good time. But, um, but yeah, apparently, as you say, he makes people famous. Yeah, well, we like, yeah, he does make people famous. Well, we'd like to thank you for coming on Getting Geeky with Game Relief. I know we kind of had to move our schedules around because we're in different parts of the, the country, uh, the world and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So I'm obviously, it's, it's five o'clock in the morning here in the UK. Um, so, but it's nice. I was just saying to, I was just saying it's nice to be up before the kids, really. It's a nice treat, really. So there you go. Do you have a lot of kids then? Uh, I got three. Yeah, three boys. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a busy household. They're normally up for about six and they don't stop until bedtime. So. Well, there you go. Yeah, I know how that is. We have five kids ourselves. Oh, do you? Right. Wow. Gosh. They're usually up before five o'clock in the morning and stuff, whatnot, depending. So you have a new game on Kickstarter. What can you tell us about it, Dr. Claire? Yeah, well, um, well, basically, uh, it's similar to, to what, what we've just been talking about. So it's a social card game for three to six players. Uh, and basically, the idea is that you are you've you were born with the ability to speak to animals and you've always had that gift. And so growing up, you kind of become friends with animals. You've ended up getting into a career which is kind of um, performing or helping animals perform competitively in a kind of Olympic style competition. Uh, and so you'll need to choose, you'll, you'll get a hand of seven cards and you'll have three different physical events to think about from different categories. Um, and it will be such that the way that the events are chosen is such that there won't be one animal that's clearly going to win all three. You'll have to compromise a little bit. So you need to choose from your hands one animal to represent you across all three of those events. Uh, and then there is a, uh, for each event, there's a kind of discussion phase where you get to pre present your strategy and kind of think cleverly about how you might uh, approach that event to get the most, the best performance. And then you move on to voting. Um, and there's a blind voting system where you vote for the other animals and not your own to make sure there's no kind of bias in the system. And then that's it. You go through the three events. It takes about 20 or 30 minutes to play in total. Um, sometimes a bit quicker than that, actually. Uh, and yeah, we've been developing it for quite a long time, actually, uh, for several years. And uh, it, it came out of um, so last year we did do a project, but we hadn't built the crowd really properly, and it, it, um, we cancelled it after just about a couple of weeks. And now we're funded, so we're um, a few days in, and we're funded and, and hunting down stretch goals. So it's going really well. Well, there you go. So, you, how does a doctor go from uh, being a doctor? I guess are you? Well, that, that's where I should start. Are you a, a doctor of animals? Because with the, being a card a card game we're doing with animals, are you a vet or something? <laughs> no, no. So I'm a I'm a doctor of humans, uh, the, the animal of man. Um, it, so good question. I mean, I I have so I've been when did I start medical training? I started my medical degree in 2012. Um, which is a it's actually similar to the states the system here so um uh normally you can do medicine straight after you straight out of school when you're kind of 18 but i did it as a graduate like they do in the states so i did a math degree first and then went on to medicine um but effectively i was it came it kind of came up really it kind of this this project kind of landed in my lap rather than me deciding to go out and, and find it um, it just came out from conversations with friends and developed into a kind of a bit of a game that we'd play, a parlor game we'd play in a in a group. And then at some point, it was about must have been about three years ago now. My wife kind of challenged me because I've been talking about trying to get it published for ages and ages, and she was just like, "Well, you need to just do it or not do it because you need to stop talking about it now." <laughs> um, so so yeah, we just I decided to go for it and got all the art done and the design and. Um, so I don't really know how that happened, to be honest. It was just kind of was a decision um, a few years ago, but it's it's good fun. Have you always been in gaming, or where, when did that start? Yeah, so I've always been into gaming to an extent. I've only recently, probably about six or seven years ago, discovered the kind of you know the new modern designer board games kind of cardboard revolution. Um, uh, but I've always been into games, and I've always my parents always said when I was tiny, like two or three, I used to just want to play games all the time, um, and that's that's kind of always been the way. Um, and I think you know, there's not much time when you're when you're studying for medicine. You know, you are doing placements and and reading and and learning for your exams. But um, that's why it's taken so long. So it, you know, it has it's not the most complex of games, and it has taken about probably eight years or something to develop it in total, including all the time as a parlor game. So basically, just I just spent time that I could on it and didn't rush things. Um, and eventually, 
over that time it, it developed itself into a, into a proper game so yeah cool cool being so oh you're going back to your degree and whatnot i over here in the states it seems like after they get done with that they have to do a lot of training under other doctors and whatnot like res i guess at the residencies and stuff do you guys do that as well yeah we do so it's, it's a similar system so we have two years straight out of when you finish uni where you have to do um what they call foundation years so foundation year one and two and in that time you are doing a lot of the kind of um dog's body work in the hospital so you're doing a lot of uh, filling in drug charts learning about how to do the job looking after patients overnight when they're not well um but there's always somebody above you there's always someone you're learning from um uh and so that's kind of two years of experience in all different areas of the hospital um and then after that you then choose your specialty training you choose where to go whether you want to do what i've done which is family medicine and when you have a clinic at, in a practice and people come and book in to see you for 10 minutes or whether you want to do hospital medicine and all the various specialties you could do there. So yeah, so that's, that's kind of the, the, the setup here. Um, but it's similar. Yeah. It's like a residency, but it's our own kind of more, yeah, slightly different system. Cool. Ben. so do you have your own practice then, or do you work with a bunch of other doctors or what now you mean, or when I'm training? Yeah, right now. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So now, so I literally just in August, I've qualified as a, as a GP. So I've now finished my training. I'm done. I'm now kind of self-employed, um, family doctor a gp as they call it here um and yeah so i work in a practice a gp practice i patients book in to see me they um have 10 minutes each uh and you know they c- it could be anything from a, a mole on your foot or a bunion uh to kind of uh, being short of breath and having to go into hospital because you've got a clot on your lungs so um it's it's a, it's a great job actually really varied i uh, really enjoy it but, uh, yeah it's in a practice with other doctors with about kind of at the moment about eight or nine other doctors most days and all the nurses and all the admin staff as well so yeah it's a nice team so do you get a lot of time to play board games then with the other doctors or <laughs> no no i really don't and that's that's one of the shames and, and one thing i was saying to richard was that uh, having any time to play board games with anyone can prove a bit of a challenge um because obviously with the three boys at home and with trying to work on the project in the evening sometimes in the weekends and um and I think just it happens to be that locally there aren't many people that have time or space in their life to play board games. So I've been I've been evangelizing games for years, and I've had to gravitate towards the more um, the lighter games because they're the only ones I can get to the table. Unfortunately, uh, so there are people at work I think who do play board games, and I think it may become something that um, that is possible. Uh, it's partly because at the moment I'm locuming, so I'm doing short short bursts of work for four or five weeks at a surgery, and then moving to a different surgery. So that longer term kind of gaming relationship isn't quite isn't quite developing yet but um hopefully in the future i'll be able to get some games in yeah well there you go there you go so let's see here so do your family play games your wife or your kids or where are they how are they old enough to play games with you yeah yeah very much so so um and i've i've written a bit of a blog that's a bit um uh been a bit dormant for a while because of this project but um about playing games with kids so i've got Ezra's now four, um, Eli's two, and, um, and Simeon, the littlest, is now about six months. Um, and, the, and the older two uh, very much play games. We, we play kind of Loop and Louie quite regularly. Uh, we play First Orchard, you know, all the kind of Haber hit kids games, Rhino Hero, those things um, with them. Uh, and my wife does enjoy a game occasionally. She, she likes – so somehow I managed to teach her Agricola because she's not the biggest fan of learning complex rules, but she's um, managed to pick that one up. So we play that occasionally uh and patchwork um we play occasionally it, it is hard because she's quite, often, often quite tired in the evenings when i'm when we've got time to play games uh after looking after the kids all day so um but probably about once a month we get something to the table with the two of us and then i play with the kids probably once a week uh, and actually a couple of times a week um so i'm playing something but it's just kids games really frustrate me because they're so there's no decisions in most of them uh, so I, I'm longing for something deeper. I'm trying to get Suburbia out, but no one's played it with me yet. Oh, well, yeah, that's where I struggle too. Um, so let's see, yeah, because mm-hmm. some of my kids sometimes want to play, sometimes they get frustrated and don't want to play, but that's what our whole podcast is about. Um, it's called Getting Geek with Game Relief, and where me and my family will be doing the, the gaming. On Mondays, we're going to be doing role-playing games together. Um, I have kids ranging from 14 to 4, and we're going to role play together. Um, and then on Wednesdays, I'll be doing something like this where we talk to Project Creator Wishlist Wednesday. And on Fridays, me and my kids will go over different games that we've played and review them. So I'm kind of excited about that, what we're doing with that. Um, 
That's brilliant. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, Where would we find this blog you talk of, Dr. Claire? Oh, I see. Yeah, so if you go to www.bigimaginationgames.com, uh, you'll find my website. Uh, and on the, the first tab there is called It's Your Turn, Daddy. That's the kind of the title that I give it to my blog because of when it first came about. Um, so if you click on that, there'll be a load of uh, blog entries about games I've reviewed. And I'm kind of reviewing it from a parental perspective. So, um, you know, the idea... I just got frustrated with the fact there's no decisions in most of these games and it would be so easy to add a decision or two to make it interesting for the for the parent. Um, so that's mainly the kind of focus and the angle of the blog. Um, but yeah, uh, check it out if you'd like to. But I'm, I'm hoping to get more of those done once this project's um, finished because I haven't got much time at the moment to um, to write it all up. And there is actually, there's one video review. I did, I did a Lupin Louie video review on YouTube as well. So um, and if you just type in Big Imagination Games on YouTube, you'll find our channel there as well. Cool, cool beans. And so I remember you talking with Richard vaguely um, about uh, it was pretty intriguing to me, but some kind of mechanic to deal with kids in creating a future game, depending on how well, I guess you you had it. Um, you actually what do you call it? You didn't you left yourself open because we weren't sure if this game was going to fund. But as you stated, it has funded thus far. So, yeah. So one of I've got two major ideas for the next project. Um and one of them, which again, yeah, it really struck me as something interesting, um, was this idea of having a family game system. So, um, so you can imagine, say, for example, with with Carcassonne, um, which is obviously a very quite a simple game. Um, at a certain age, the, the, your child becomes able to play kind of properly with the full rules. But until then, you do your kind of house rules and you change things. And you don't use farmers; you just have the simple ones where you put them on the road. Uh, and my idea was to have a kind of a formalized rule set for games and even to design a game from the ground up with this in mind, where you had asymmetric rules that depended on your on the age of the player. So you start off with a toddler who had their own rules and their own winning conditions and their own things to do that they would enjoy as part of the game. Uh, um, maybe a dexterity element, maybe, you know, similar to First Orchard, rolling a dice and seeing what happens. And then that would interact with your with a grown up with an adult rule set with a secondary school age child rule set with a primary school age rule set and somehow all of these different rule sets would integrate into an actual game you could play together um the idea being that then once you've once the player wins at a certain level three times or two or three times they move up to the next more complicated rules um yeah so it, it was born out of a frustration about not being able to play games and whenever i've tried to you know being interrupted by kids and would it be, i thought it'd be interesting if you know rather than when the baby cries and needs feeding that could be a, a game condition something could happen and trigger in the game like a random event rather than have, drawing a card um so i mean the thing about the idea is it's interesting and i think it'll be fun it would just be a, a huge huge amount of work so much play testing to balance that out um and at the moment i don't think i have the network to do that um but it's certainly something that I'm interested in and something I'll look at in the future um, to try and I think it'd be a great thing for parents, really, just to engage the whole family in gaming the whole time. I really like the idea. Yeah, we'd be open to if you need any play testers. Yeah, we'd love to do that for you. Yeah, that would be great. I'll, I'll add you to the well, I'll, I'll put you I'll start the list and put your names on it uh, for people who might, who might play test. Yeah, <laughs> you're top of the list. Yeah. Um, but, but there's another idea that I've had, which may um, which may happen before that anyway. Um so that might be a bit, of, a bit of timing coming. There you go. On the first one on the list, you heard it here. So is that one – are you going to keep that one secret from us? Uh, no, I mean I won't keep it secret, um, uh, but it's only in the quite early stages of development now. So um, I have done – I've made – I don't know about you, um, but I love a good spreadsheet. Um, and, <laughs> and I've made a kind of battle resolution spreadsheet for this game that I've, that I've kind of uh, come up with. Um, but that's all I've done. So it's it's in very early stages. Uh, the idea the idea of this other game was to kind of recreate an experience that I had as part of a online community playing a, an internet um, tick based game um, for years when I was a kind of teenager. Uh, and that was when you're in you're in an alliance. You have a kind of big alliance in in that in that game of um, sort of twenty people, which won't be obviously so big and for a board game. Um, and you would get some income every turn. You would then use that income to make developments of your of your units that you can use, and you'd use some of it to buy land, and then which gets you more income. And you could use some of the money to do intelligence on other people in the that you're playing against to see if you want to see if you can attack them. And there are multiple different tech trees and different um, 
different uh, route te technology routes would interact better or worse with other technology routes in terms of being attacked or attacking them. So my kind of idea is to try and replicate that experience in a in a game. Um, so it's a challenge because it's you know you only got two hours to play rather than um, this game used to be played over two or three months online with ten minute ticks. So it's it's different, but um, that's the kind of challenge to have a team based game where uh, you're in an alliance and you're defending each other and um, sending mobs out and they're moving closer to the opposition to the kind of rival players every turn. Uh, and you kind of have to manage your mobs, your people that you're sending, and also technologies and things. So yeah, it's they're both quite interesting ideas. Uh, but at the moment, I'm just completely absorbed in this other project. So we'll have to see um, once this is finished, how much time I get to look at the new stuff. Well, there you go. So what can I ask? What internet game inspired that one? Yeah, well, it's, it's so you, you probably you won't have heard of it, but there's a game called Bush Terrian. If you, uh, so B U S H T A R I O N. Uh, if you go to bushterrian.com. Um, and it was quite a small UK thing that, that grew up um, maybe when I was 15, so probably a good, how long ago is that, 16 years ago. Um, and it's, it's still going. You can still sign up for free. You can still have a look, still play it. And I'd recommend it, actually, uh, for some people who've got a bit of time to spare. Uh, it is a really interesting game, and, the, and it's been um, well developed over the years. Uh, the designer hasn't really been involved for quite a long time, and it's it, the community is sort of waning a bit. Um but it is, it is good fun, and, and that certainly will give you an idea of the sort of uh, experience I'm trying to replicate. It's cool. It looks like it might be like some kind of world, a war game. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a funny theme. It's, it's themed on the idea that you're a gardener, um, and you've got a certain amount of land, and then you're also kind of defending that land and stealing land off others. So it's a slightly bizarre theme. Um, there was another game called Planetarian, which was a uh, based on planets, uh, and it's more kind of an obvious, more an obvious theme of you know your galaxy and you're looking after your own planets and stealing for other people, and then it kind of I think it grew out of that. So it's it's a bit strange being a gardener with a, with an army, um, but yeah, that's the that's the idea. And I don't know whether I don't know how much conflict there's going to be in my game um, because I'm, I'm I'm not such a fan of that. So um, we'll see. But I haven't even I haven't even themed it yet, so it's quite early days. Well, there you go. So going back to your um, the champion. Let's see here. Going back to your game that's currently on kickstarter uh champions of the wild what inspired that game well that came out of a conversation with my brother it must have been about eight years ago or nine years ago now um he just we were just on a on a on a journey somewhere and he asked me um what animal would i choose to defend myself against an army of advancing penguins so, so it's a slightly slightly strange question to ask he's an interesting character my brother um uh, and I kind of thought for a second and said, well, maybe a polar bear, you know, seems to be good. They'll, they'll do well on the ice. They're quite um, strong. And um, he kind of said, well, I choose an elephant. And then we had a discussion about it and uh, it became clear that he was just going to sit on the back of his elephant's neck uh, and be perfectly safe whilst the penguins can't fly. So they're <laughs> kind of running around the bottom. Whereas um, the polar bear kind of reasonably quickly got overwhelmed by the sheer number of, of penguins. And um, I was kind of caught by the penguins and tagged by them. Um, so that was kind of the first conversation I ever had about anything like this. And uh, it, I found it really interesting and quite an intriguing thing to ask. And I ended up, you know, I asked a few friends similar questions and uh, it, 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 um, it gradually, we, we kind of realized and developed it a bit and realized that actually, if you just set one event, then um, you'll choose the same animals or similar animals. But if you set multiple events, then you need to compromise. And that's where you get the really funny discussions about animals doing things badly which is it's basically the thing that the game is themed around you know talking about animals doing things really badly talking about a horse trying to dig a hole or talking about an octopus doing a 10 meter dive and just kind of very gradually falling off the diving board and into the water or you know all sorts of funny conversations you have when you're playing the game that's the kind of idea cool cool bean so it looks like you have to um so after you pick the event and the animals it looks like you have to justify the different why they would how they would fare and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. And so, so there's a point in the game where you have your event, you know the conditions, you know what's happening, and then you have to think, right, how am I going to approach this event? So say you're doing um, hide and seek and you've got quite a big animal. You've got, um, say, um, a horse as an example that came up. Um, how are you going to get your horse to hide in a stately home? So, you know, what, what, do you, what would you do if you, um, if you had that? Like, what, what, how would you get your horse to hide in a house, in a giant kind of stately home with big halls, big corridors, chandeliers? I'd probably go in a room, like maybe the bathroom, and close the door if they could. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, maybe as far away from the front door as, as possible. There was there was a um, – so Steve Tudor was, one, was uh, a reviewer for Polyhedron Collider, and he was saying that 
one of the conversations they had that was quite funny was that someone had said that they could put their horse in front of a, a giant portrait of a horse and kind of stand still with their leg raised so that it would look like they were part of the picture. Um, uh, you know, and, and it's that sort of thing, you know, you, you might, the, the person with the anaconda might, might ask the snake to kind of crawl into the toilet pipes and just have its head poking out so it can still breathe. Um, well, actually, uh, and so, you know, it's that, it's that sort of imaginative, um, how am I going to make my animal do well in this event kind of thing? Um, especially I, I played once with my, uh, with a friend of mine, Ruth, uh, and we were playing a game where they're kind of painting, painting pots, which isn't currently in the, in the event list, but it was at one stage. And I had a gorilla. So I was like, obviously going to win this event because it can paint. It's got opposable thumbs. I didn't really give much explanation. And then she kind of gave this whole kind of five minute, um, presentation about how eagles were, um, had such kind of, beautiful uh strokes of their arms they'd put their put their wings in the paint and kind of dash it across the paint pot and do a kind of abstract art piece on their on the pot and she ended up winning that event because she'd explained it so well so um so you can win events just based on uh kind of imaginative discussion and being kind of clever who decides who wins well so it's a blind voting system so so effectively you decide who wins so if there's five of us in the in the event or six of us in the event say I will have five voting tokens. So, and I won't vote for myself, but I will say in hide and seek, I think that the hummingbird's going to come first. I think the um, cheetah's going to come second. I think the um, killer whale's going to come third because they're stuck outside, and the blue whale will be fourth, uh, for example. Um, and I'd hand those tokens out face down so they wouldn't know who who came where. I would do that for those players. They would do it for everyone else. So, you, so you'd all get a token from other players. So if I were in that example, if I was a hummingbird, I might get everyone giving me a first place token uh, for that first event, which would be worth kind of 10 points per token. Um, uh, and then you'd move on to the second event. So, But you'd keep the, that voting secret until the very end of the game. So you don't know who's winning and you can't do kind of tactical voting in the later events. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a blind voting system decided by the player. So it could be that if someone does a really good explanation and they've actually done something really clever, you might give them first place where um, you wouldn't normally Um or, or more commonly, kind of, you just go on what would actually, what you think would actually likely happen. Um, yeah, but there, it can be really funny, and, and uh, sometimes pe trainers often make actually big mistakes as well and do something stupid, which ends up um, making their animal kind of handicapped and they can't actually compete in the vet at all. So, cool. So, is there a certain amount of animals already in the game, or how many animals are there? There's there's 42 animals in the game to start with. Um, although actually, with our stretch goals now, there's uh, there's 44. Um, now, uh, so it's enough for seven cards each for six players plus a couple spare. So you won't quite know. Um, you won't. Oh, sorry, I'm just attack, just moving a cat out of the way. Um, you won't quite know which animals everyone's everyone's got because there'll be a couple of spare animals now. Um, yeah, so 42 animals. Okay, so you pick, so you get dealt the animals. So you don't know what you get first off, and then you have to just decide for the events. Yeah, so you don't initially when you have when you when you're choosing the events as a team as a kind of you know you get event selectors and they choose one event each. So three of you will choose an event. At that stage, you don't know what your animals are, so you can't choose based on your animal hand. And then after the three events have been selected and you know what the rules are, you then get dealt your seven animals and you have seven animals to choose from. Oh, okay, and then so you pick whatever one's going to be best, or can you use one for each event, or? No, so you so that that's that's quite a key thing actually. So you you only choose one animal for all three events, um, which is what makes it interesting because you know, there's always going to be one event you're not very good at, and that's where your strategic thinking is going to come in. So you just choose one animal for all three events. And how many events do we have to choose from? Well, so there's a, the, the event stack in total is is fifth. Well, it's actually fifty to start with, but now fifty two again with the stretch goal that we've unlocked. Um, and so that's ten events in each category of speed, power, endurance, technical, and team. Uh, well, it's 11 now in technical and power because of the stretch goal. Uh, yeah, so lots of replayability, actually, lots of different things. And, and when you choose your events, you take the top three cards in one stack and you choose your favorite one. So um, so there is a bit of choice when you, as an event selector about what kind of what would be a more fun event to do. Cool. So do you have a favorite animal and a favorite event? Yeah. So you, um, so what, so before you do anything else, you, you put out the five event stacks and three players are chosen at random to be event selectors and they will each choose a different category. So I might choose speed and then I take the top three cards from the speed category and choose my, which one I want to compete, which one I want to be part of the competition this time. So I'll choose my favorite one, which one I think is going to be most fun to do. So it might be the hundred meter sprint, for example, hundred meter dash, and I'll put that down. And then the next person 
um, will do the same in a different category. So, you'd, so that's how you choose your what what the three events are going to be for your sort of competition that time. And then once you've done that, you then get your animal hand and you choose the animal that you want to to represent you in that in that particular competition with those three particular events. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, that makes sense. So, um, seeing how you're the creator and whatnot, you probably know all. I would imagine, or I would hope so, you might know all the events that are available. Do you have a favorite one out of the, all the events? Yeah, I do. So I, it was so it wasn't in the first version of the game, and I only it only came up. I only thought of it about maybe six months ago. Um, so so jousting, I love jousting. I mean, that's I, you, you'll see it on the on the campaign page if you go to it. But um, the the art for this one from from the artist is just amazing. There's a picture of a guy riding on the back of a killer whale in a water lane who's trying to kind of joust a, another guy who's riding on the back of a rhino going the other direction. Um, and I just I just love the idea. I mean, there's something there's something kind of incredible about the idea of, of riding on the back of a big animal like a lion or a polar bear isn't there, and that's always been, um, you know, an exciting thing to think about. Um, but the idea of getting, getting kind of suited up in your armour and then going out to kind of try and poke other people off their animals – particularly when their animal is a chameleon or um you know a meerkat or something small uh it's it, it's quite funny and um and also quite kind of epic so that's my favorite event i think jousting cool yeah i like that picture that you have on there with the killer whale and the rhino that's pretty cool yeah so who does your art yeah it's, it's nice isn't it the uh the artist and a great job so it's a chap um called kevin chapman um uh, from the states uh who is just incredible and i don't know how he does it um but part of the kind of audition system for the artwork was to be able to produce that sort of quality art in a short time in kind of just four hours. So you could do two a day in theory. Um, and, and he's, he's done it and it's just, it's just incredible. So um, I've got nothing but praise for, for Kevin. Um, and you should check out his, uh, his work if you can. He's got his own page, which is called Chippy Ray, Chippy Ray Art, C-H-I-P-Y, R-A, and then R-A-Y art, um, dot com. Um, and he's got a Facebook page as well, so so look him up. He's he's brilliant. Cool, and we'll make sure he put all this in the show notes. So if they're driving, they won't have to necessarily do that. So do you have a favorite animal out of all the animals as well? Well, so it's difficult because obviously it would depend on. So what you actually choose in the in the in the game will depend on the event. Um, I, I guess again, we've only got art done for about for seven or eight of them now, and having the art there really does bring it to life. Um, and of those ones, I think probably my, you know, there, there's something to be said for for the African lion. That's probably my, that's the most kind of iconic, I think, in terms of how it looks on the card and the idea of of allying with a with a lion. You know, having Aslan by your side, um, or something. You know, being able to discuss with a lion and and tell them what to do is quite, um, yeah, quite fun. So that's probably my favourite animal as well but that may change once once all the event deck is once all the animal deck has been illustrated and, and the art's been done um then you know that that may well change and especially there's quite a lot of new suggestions of animals coming from the project comments um from from backers uh so yeah there's some really good ones coming up so we'll see if that changes cool so will you honor the ones uh, their comments or how does that work is that a specific pledge amount well that's, that's a good question so so with animals um the, the lots of people make the suggestions and we're going to be um we might be doing a couple of polls during the course of the um of the project especially if we get stretch goals and we've got two animals two extra animals already so um we might be sort of asking the backers by poll which one they want to include um actually the main reason for the suggestions is actually for the events so people can suggest once you're a backer, you can suggest new events um, that you might think of. So someone suggested um, the dressage where you, you know, like you're like on a horse, but you're on your animal instead and you're trying to do things um, nicely like you would do in a dressage, a horse riding dressage tournament. Uh, or someone suggested uh, the cheese roll where there's cheese roll. Do you know about this UK competition where there's like a, uh, a big circular roll of cheese that rolls down a hill and loads of people try and chase it down the hill? Have you heard about that before? I've never heard of it. Oh man, it's it's no. bizarre. It's really it's quite dangerous and it's bizarre. It's quite a steep hill in Gloucestershire, and they um they have this massive these massive kind of double Gloucester cheeses that are kind of about thirty centimeters in diameter, and they roll them down the hill, and they go extremely fast, obviously down quite a far, down quite a steep hill, and then loads of people try and run down the hill to catch up with it, and it's it's pretty um pretty dangerous. People get hurt. But one of the uh, backers has suggested that as a possible event for the animals to do, and and maybe an, an armadillo could go up in a ball and roll down the hill um 
so and the reason for that is that we've got, we've got that suggestion um, kind of a suggestion box there uh, and some of those events are going to be included in the game um so there'll be a, a system which i won't go into about how that gets voted on and there'll be a public poll which then um uh, will then choose events to be involved in the game and if you if your event gets chosen then you'll then get to be the one who directs the art the one who thinks about well how would this card look if we had a cheese rolling saying which which animals do we want in the in the card where do you want them to be what should we have the weather being like on the card all those sorts of questions um uh so you'll be an art director just for that card uh, and you'll also get your name on that card every copy of that card ever printed so it's kind of it's a real opportunity to get everyone involved get the backers actually involved in the game and get them get their names on the product as well cool i'm really intrigued by the whole cheese rolling thing um what's the purpose <laughs> like do you get to eat it if you catch it or what happens uh I think you just um, you just win and you get some kind of prestige from being the one who caught the cheese. Um, let me just I'm just going to check it out. So it's called Cooper's Cooper's Hill. Um, is it called Cooper's Hill Race? I think. Let me just check. Uh, yeah, so Cooper, cool. Cooper's so if Cooper's Hill Cheese Rolling and Wake. If you go to Wikipedia, there's an article about it there, um, and you can see all the people lining up. Um, <laughs> so it's so dangerous, but quite funny um, to watch. So yeah, Cooper's C W O P E R. Cooper's Hill cheese rolling and wake. Um, okay, yeah, I see it here. Uh, so, is that something you've participated in? Or no, what? no, it's not. I'm afraid I don't have the um, I don't have the bravery and the and the, either the bravery or the speed to go into it. Um, no, I haven't participated. And I haven't seen it in person. No, obviously I've seen videos uh, on YouTube and things. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, just looking, at this, <laughs> it's obviously quite a uh, a profession because they've had the same winner quite a few times in a row, and they have they obviously train up for it. Um, you know, Stephen Brain. Oh, hang on, that's number seven. Chris Anderson's won it three years in a row, so he's obviously the man, the man to beat. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's pretty cool. So, yeah, that's just interesting. So the, it looks like the cheese can go um, up to 70 miles per hour. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, it goes pretty fast. Yeah, it goes pretty fast. If you're interested in it, I'd, I'd recommend um, listeners just looking at putting it on YouTube and having a look. It's, it's a fascinating little game that, that, that it do, they do once a year. Um, but I guess, yeah, I guess the thing is that uh, in theory, you could have any measurable event you could do in the in Champion of the World. You, know, you, could, have any, you could have any event in there at all. Uh, and I'd thought of lots and, and you know, we'd, and some friends, you know, we'd gone through it and, and developed it a bit. But um, I'm just aware that there's so much creativity out there and backers will have their own ideas. And this was another great idea that hadn't even come to me. So, um, and now, you know, you might have your own ideas. And um, so feel free to, to, contact me and, and let me know or, or come back to the project and you can put it in the comments. Cool. Cool beans. So if per se somebody's fallen asleep and they just barely got startled awake and they missed the, most of the podcast, um, hopefully it, it, well, it probably wouldn't be because of you or the game. It'd probably be because they're tired of my voice and listening to my podcast, <laughs> but say they did and they suddenly are awake. What would be, um, why should they go ahead and back this, especially all the games out there on Kickstarter? Yeah, well, so this this is a unique theme. I, I there's no other game that I know of um, that has this theme of um, training animals. Um, it's it's been so much fun to play, so much fun to test. It's hilarious fun. It's quick. Uh, it's family friendly, so you can play it with with kids actually from probably down to age about six, although the box is age eight and over. Um, uh, and there's nothing in the game that's crude or rude or or anything that's um, that will that will kind of exclude children. And they really enjoy actually getting into those those questions um i'd also back it now because um just because you can be involved and, and the sooner you can suggest your event the less likely someone is to take it and the more likely you will be to get in the game um and to get your name on the on the card and and uh, and be involved so yeah that's I, i'd say that's why because it's um basically because it's so much fun and, and come and join and, and come and be involved in, in the development Cool. Yeah, it sounds like it. it. sounds pretty fun. So now going on to the next uh, portion of our podcast, it's called uh, Adventures in Application Acquisition, where we talk about an application, whether it be a cell phone or a tablet or a computer or a video game. Is there an application you use? It doesn't have to be related to board games, but it could be. Oh, so you mean like an app? Yes, sir. Oh, right. Um, so what kind of apps... What apps do I use on my phone? Or yeah, I don't really, I don't really have a tablet. Yeah, just, a, just an app that you use a lot of. It doesn't have to be related to board games. It could even be something doctory if you wanted. Uh, yeah. Let me just let me just have a think. So, um, what apps do I use? Do you, you presumably you have WhatsApp in the states, don't you? That's not that interesting. 
Um, no, we don't, but well, we might. I remember somebody talked about it um, that I just talked to. Um, I think he, yeah, he said talked about WhatsApp. It's like, uh, is it like uh, Messenger or something? Yeah, do you know, it's it's been a, a bit of a life changer socially. So, um, so it's called WhatsApp, and almost now it's become almost ubiquitous. So everyone, almost everyone's got it in in the UK, uh, and it only costs like twenty p or something to get. Um, but the idea is, so it's it's like Messenger. It's quite straightforward, and you've probably got a similar software actually in the states, I imagine. Um, but for some reason, it was the first time that, that someone had made software that's so easy to make groups. So you make a group of your family, you make a group of your close friends, you make a group of people that whatever are playtesting your game or that sort of thing. Um, and and that's basically it. You just send a message, uh, and everyone in the group gets the message, and it gives them a, an alert. And it's very very straightforward. But somehow, they, I think they were just the first company to do it, and it's and it, and to do it well. So it. So there's a problem with you know facebook messaging is not quite as good to, at, at whatsapp does and you've got you look at your phone and you see all the different groups you know i've got my family i've got my extended family i've got my um my wife's family i've got my closest friends i've got my people i work with um uh so yeah it's just a really easy way of keeping in touch with people and it and it um enables you to kind of not have to go on facebook and read your live stream every every day but you can just message directly and see what people are up to and see how they're going on well, yeah, I really like that. Uh, I'll have to check it out because I really like uh, somebody else I recently talked to talked about that. So let's say you own the rights to WhatsApp. What would be one thing you would do to to fix it? Oh, to fix it. Oh, good question. Um, or just make it better. One thing. Well, that, do you know, I, how can we make WhatsApp better? I don't even know. I, I don't think I've got anything for that. Um it's just so slick. Well, another thing I like well, is that you can see you can see when people have um, read the message um, uh, as well. So that's quite useful because if someone's not read it, you know that they've not seen it. Um, I don't know. You know, I have to have a think about that when I get back to you. Well, there you Sorry. go. Yeah, that's what I like about Messenger. Yeah, I'm like, but then it, it also makes me anxious as well because I can see somebody read it, but then they haven't got back to me. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. It's a, it's a similar thing, but at least you know they have read it. It kind of there, there's a, there's it goes a kind of um, a grey tick when it's been delivered on their phone, and then it goes to a kind of blue tick when they've actually read it when it, when it, they've opened the app and clicked on the screen. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it can be a bit. You can get a bit paranoid looking at it, but. Uh, yeah, it's, it's useful. Cool. Yeah, I really like it. I'll have to check that out. That sounds really cool because you're not the only one that's talked about it. Yeah. I don't know if people use it over in the States or they just don't tell me about what they're using or I'm yeah, I think, not as noisy as some people. I don't know. I think it does exist because um, uh, cause Kevin has it installed on his phone, uh, which I asked him to so I could keep in touch with him. Um, yeah, the artist, I mean. So it does exist. Well, there you go. Cool cool beans well let's see here i know pretty soon here you're yeah everybody in your household is probably going to be waking up so we don't want to keep you all day but we really appreciate you coming on getting geeky with gamer relief if somebody wants to find you minus coming over there to the uk to stalk you <laughs> how would they go about doing that dr claire uh, so there's a few ways so obviously the kickstarts project you can just type in champion of the world on the kickstarter and send me a message on on there as a creator um there's also um, Facebook, so facebook.com forward slash Big Imagination Games UK is our Facebook page, and we put almost everything on there. Uh, and then we've got Twitter as well, which is twitter.com forward slash T-W-E-C-E-B-I-G, T -W -C -E -B -I -G. and my website is um, bigimagination.games.com, and you can message me through there. Or, um, following all that, you can just email me at tc at bigimaginationgames.com. Cool, cool beans. So I guess that's where uh, Richard came up with the TC, huh? From your email? Yeah. Uh, well, no. So we, we, I think we were just talking, and he was he was asking what what, what people call me, and I just said um, TC, which is what I've always I've always been really growing up. Um, yeah, but that's uh, so that's why the that's why that's the email because that's kind of how I'm known. That's what my friends call me. Well, there you go. Cool. Yeah, but once again, we wanted to thank you for coming on getting geeky with game relief i know we had try we've been trying for a while so we might have been able to have you on before richard but things didn't work out so yeah i guess he beat us to the punch no i'm sorry it's my fault it's because it's because my kids had a bad night and um they'd been up several times and i, I getting up at five was was uh, no longer became an option but thank you for having me on and thank you for taking the time to to, to chat with me and um yeah i'm excited to i'm looking forward to listening up on your podcast i haven't had a chance yet because i've been doing all the project but i'm looking forward to catching up with them Oh, yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And we'll let you get back to, I guess, doctoring with people and taking care of your family. So we really appreciate it. 
Good stuff. Thanks. It's great to speak to you. Welcome to Kickstarter Corner. This is Game Relief, and you already know me, so let's get on with it. Well, first off, let, I'd like to wish a couple people important in my life, or people that I know pretty good, or figure that I know pretty good, a happy birthday, or happy belated birthday, whatever it may be when they're listening to this. It's Jeff Biggs' birthday. Jeff Biggs, thank you for everything you've done in our life. We really appreciate it. Couldn't have done it without you. And then David Broadbent, he was one of my friends when I was going to high school. Really couldn't have done much without him either. He really transformed my life and made it the way it is today, thanks to him and making me where who I am today. I was in, or wouldn't have gone on a mission for my church or been going to church if it wasn't for him. And then Chris Olson. I just wanted to give a shout out to him. I used to work with him when I was a pharmacy technician at a hospital there in Utah. And I wanted to say happy birthday, Chris. So happy birthday to y'all. If you have a birthday or if you want to hear your birthday shout out on getting geeky with Game Relief, go ahead and send us an email over at GameRelief at GameRelieveGo.com. Kind of like PokemonGo.com. Now on with Kickstarter Corner. Let's see what we have here. Well, we have quite a few great games on the Kickstarter corner. Let's go ahead and start with Frontier the Card Game. Become the greatest outlaw that ever lived with the awesomely Western card game by collecting notoriety and bounty. Yeehaw! We just barely got our copy today so we can review it. Haven't opened it, but the box looks wonderful. Can't wait to get that to the table and then tell you all about it. And then we also have Angel Blood Publishing. We just barely did an episode on them. This is um, Angel Blood Publishing making an RPG game that we all want. After 13 years, Angel Blood, the tabletop RPG, is ready to be unleashed to the masses. It's time for everyone to be a game changer. Check that out if you wonder about that. I just did an episode with the creator. It was a great one, I think. We talked about 80s cartoons. So go ahead and give that a look out and listen to it if you haven't. And you can know what it's all about. This one ends in 37 days from now, the 9th of November. So check it out for sure. And then let's see what else I have here. Quite a few of them. So let me tell you about them, how to pronounce this. Mainly I know it as Full Moon Down, but it's T-S-U-K-U-Y-U-M-I. Full Moon Down. I do do an episode with them. I will release that later on. But it is a strategic tabletop board game in which unique asymmetric factions fight for world dominion after the moon crashed into the earth. This is from King Raccoon Games, and I'll have Felix on later to talk about it. So that's great. Check them out on the Kickstarter. They funded pretty quickly, and they still have 33 days to go. Going through the 5th of November. Then we have War Titans, Invaders Must Die. Choose a pilot and take control of colossal robots in this cooperative board game, rich in amazing miniatures and multiple scenarios. I really hope they fund. They have nine days to go. They got about twenty more thousand dollars to raise, but they've already made forty four thousand of the sixty four thousand. Ends on the twelfth of October. And this game, it looks like you get a lot of bang for your buck. Check them out on the Kickstarters. And then let's see here. What else do we have? Let's see, we have Trench. This one funded after the relaunch. They have 16 days to go. I really like the idea of this one. It's called Play With Art. It's a timeless, innovative, abstract strategy game for two players based on the Trench Wars of World War I. And it looks like it's kind of combined of checkers and chess. That's what I would consider it. But it's a lot more appeasing to the eyes. They fund it in three hours. Check them out by Outer Limit Games over on the Kickstarters. So that is great news. And then, like I said, we went over Sakami, Full Moon Down. So, or however you say that. I'm not even sure how to say that. And then a new one that is on our list is also another one that funded really, really quick. It's Gloom of Killforth Expansions. Now, this is a fantasy quest game expansion. The first set of expansions of Gloom of Killforth, the sellout fantasy quest game, plus the reprint of the original game. Now, this is really pretty art. And what is even cooler is I sat down with the designer, and, and he just sounds like a really down-to-earth guy. 
Can't wait to air that episode. Check it out. It's got some pretty, pretty art. I would love to play that game. And then let's see what else we have here. Those are just a few of the great games that we have on the Kickstarter corner. We got Cheese Quest. Let's see here. Yeah, Phil's Cheese Quest. You want to go ahead and get two pieces of cheese to the back home before the other people do. It's a game of strategy and sabotage. Try to win and not get hit by the rats, not get hit by the cats or the traps. That's pretty cool. Then we got Rooster Rush. Why did the chicken cross the road? We don't really know, but check out Rooster Rush and get your rooster safely across the game, across the road. This is by Mayday Games and made by the creators who made Seven Wonders and Takedo, just to name a few. Check them out on the Kickstarter. They're only going for a little bit longer. You have until the 8th of October. And remember, they're doing a giveaway over at thegiveawaygeek.com like some of these others. Then we got Swords and Cells. This is, um, let's see, yeah, this is great. And this is where you can, let's see here. Um, I know over on the Giveaway Geek as well with this one on Swords and Cells that they're giving away coinage for your gameage. That's kind of cool. I always like to say that. But yeah, check them out. I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about it. Let's see. Swords and Cells. This has 10 days to go. It's 32% of the way funded. I hope they make it. But just so you know, it's re Swords and Cells. Rewrite history in 1000 AD. Swords and Cells is an epic conquest and diplomacy game about leading your armies and fleets through medieval Europe in 1000 AD. They've got about $9,800 and they're going for $30,000. So go ahead and back them on the Kickstarters. And then don't forget about Jonathan M. Thompson's uh, his role-playing settings for Cepheus System as well as for the Savage Worlds. This is in Robert Asprin's The Cold Cash War. Check them out on the Kickstarter as well. And then Dave Killingsworth um, from Solar Flare Games Recently, he had to cancel his um, his Kickstarter, but don't worry, he's got some other good news going on. He's got uh, it's a great a great show. I'm going to start on the Netflix. It's called Robotech, the card game. Well, actually, um, yeah, actually, he's making Robotech Force of Arms. And this is going to be really cool. Solar Flare Game will come out with this the next year. So that's kind of exciting. I'll check it out on the Kickstarter, on the Netflix. If you want to watch it too, and if you want me to review it, let me know. Send us an email at GameRelief at GameRelieveGo.com. That's kind of like Pokemon Go, but Game Relief Go. And then we've got Scrooge. Can you out Scrooge Scrooge? Can you? This is a game of survival where you're trying to out Scrooge Scrooge and this is going through the 5th of October they they went ahead and funded and that was really exciting so now they're going for stretch goals and then don't forget about let's see here don't forget about Clint Stoker's arcade fighter I really hope this one makes it it's like bringing Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat to the tabletop. It unfortunately, it doesn't look like it'll fund. He has 56 hours to go, but you never know. He's got almost a thousand dollars out of 5,800. So if you want, if you're driving around or something, go ahead and check this out on the Kickstarters. Give it a back and see if we can bring arcade fighting to the tabletop. And let's see here. I think. That is about all we have for Kickstarter Corner this week on Getting Geeky with Game Relief. Do you want to hear us talk about your game either through an interview or Kickstarter Corner? If you do, go ahead and reach out to us on at our email at GameRelief at GameRelieveGo.com. Also, look for us to be getting a great prize for you over at Chip Theory Games and also if you won one of the one of nine games and knew about it we will be getting those out relatively shortly so and there's gonna be some couple other winners because not everybody got a hold of me but I'll go ahead and get the ones out that we know about first and we will go from there let's see here now 
go ahead and get geeky or stay geeky or gain your geekhood back with game relief and those you love we'll catch you on the flip side <laughs> Gamer Leaf levels up. Tune in next week to see if Gamer Leaf's luck holds up.